Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Theo, for the introduction. Um, it gives me great pleasure today, this evening, this morning, wherever you may be. I, Chris, presumably, is in the lovely LA sunshine, morning sunshine. And as Theo said, that we're here in the dark uh, UK beginnings of winter, I suppose. Uh, Chris, really, Professor Christopher Chakris really doesn't need much introduction in the field of yoga studies. I think one could probably say he's the doyen of uh, university yoga studies around the world, being um, the founding director of the Masters Master of Arts in Yoga Studies at LMU, Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where he's also the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology. And I've had the great pleasure of visiting Professor Chapel there at LMU and um, had a, it's a really sort of thriving world of of yoga studies and wider Indological fields. He's also, as well as being uh, such a driving force in yoga studies, he's done great things for Indological studies more broadly uh, over there on the West Coast and, and the world over. And he's published more than 20 books, so I'm not even going to try to summarize the, the, the wide range of, of topics that he's, he's published in. Is advisor to multiple organizations, including the Forum on Religion and Ecology. And in fact, ecology is a strong thread through his publications. And perhaps we'll hear a little bit about that today. I'm not sure on the, the elemental side of things. Uh, he's also advisor to the Ahinsa Center in Pomona, the Dharma Academy of North America at Berkeley, and a member of our Jain Studies Center at, at SOAS. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to hand over. Chris's topic for today is five element meditations in Hindu, Buddhist and Jain yoga. So thanks very much, Chris, for agreeing to join us. Thank you very much, Theo and James. It's great to be in your company and I'm really honored to be able to share with you today. So I do have a PowerPoint and what we will be doing is um, viewing, practicing a little bit, and here we go. Okay. So introducing myself, um, I did want to honor uh, the place where I trained. So if you look in your little box, you'll see this funny looking barn. And up above was our yoga studio and down below was our restaurant. And this was my home of homes for solid 12 years. And I'll show you an image of my teacher in a minute. And when Jim, I knew we would mention the more than 20 books, but that actually has more to do with um, larger projects more than 15 edited volumes, co-edited volumes. But I did want to share that here in America, we had the Nancy Drew series and the Tom Swift series that were my deep affection as a child. And I used to actually try to read along the library shelves. My mother was a librarian eventually, and I have several family members. Books have been a passion. And I just wanted to share with you, uh, as we begin, my own little um, Tom Swift series, which started with Harming Creativity, my 20s, which is about human agency. Then in my 30s, uh, Nonviolence to Animals, Earth and Self, which has to do with ethics. In my 40s, a grappling with the diverse positions taken vis-a-vis -vis yoga in a book called Reconciling Yogas. And then in my 50s, a book about really the spiritual and philosophical practice of yoga. And now in my 60s, the topic at hand. And I want to speak before I move into the content and ask you to um, reflect a little bit on the cover of the book. I want to talk a little bit about my methodology, which is grounded in text, reflection, and practice. So for each of the works, there were several years of translation and the inclusion of at least pieces of translation from from 
again, long ago from Sanskrit language generally, include it as part of the project. And as I sort of signal uh, through the different phases of our lives, different questions grab us. And for me, it was in my 20s, who am I? What am I doing? And then integrating theological, philosophical reflections uh, as an extension of the, that question, which keeps coming up again and again, who am I? What am I doing? And then um, really putting it into an idiom that includes self reflectively, a self that is shaped by practice. So I invite us now to sort of go in a little bit closer to the screen. And I think there's a little bit too many people um, now we're in the 60s, it could get even higher. But what I'd like you to do is to go close to the screen and gaze first at the figure in the bottom right. Then to the right of that figure, just to the left on our screen, you'll see a couple more figures, the different species. And then above the head of the figure, you'll see a boulder. And really framing the picture in very significant ways, we see the earth and we see forest. This painting hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And since teenager years, I would visit and really appreciate not only this immersion in nature scene, which is called The Hermit by John Singer Sargent, but I would also just enjoy his celebration of the human form of color, of the grandiosity of what is possible for the human. And he painted many of the stellar figures of the Gilded Age. And yet he reveled on occasion with giving voice, picture, darshan to nature itself. And this was, even though he was a solidly English American painter, this painting came to us from his time in France. Now I want to give a little bit of homage, a little bit of namaste, namastasyai, to Grani Anjali Inti. And it was so interesting because I was trying to put together a slide that had the data with her photograph and work. I earlier showed you the photograph of the ashram uh, that she dedicated in October 1972. I moved to be on Long Island to study with her shortly thereafter. And her background, uh, as you can see from this surname, is actually of um, Assamese tribal origin. And in consultation with Sh Shravana Verma Bharataki, uh, she revealed to me, and it was unknown, that her surname Inti indicates her membership to the Mishnah tribal peoples of Northeast India. She grew up in Calcutta. She toured India and also performed at um, Lincoln Center as a Bharatanatyam dancer. And she settled in the United States in the 1960s, wrote, raised up three children, and um, in her late 30s, started Yoga Anandashram. Um, she is no more, uh, as you can see, uh, died 20 years ago. And uh, the ashram is coming up on its 50th anniversary. So now fast forward to this image. And Jim mentioned the robustness of our programming here, and we are nothing other. We would not exist if we did not have these amazingly 
talented students that show up every single year. And for first assignment with your first semester with me, the artist will be featured here, Gabriela Ayala Canizales, presented this as she managed to somehow just capture the spirit that she felt that spoke to her from the Rig Veda, her very first philosophy class with me. And as I gazed upon this image and I saw that she had the earth strewn with flowers, she had the trees, the mountains, she had sun and moon. I just said, oh my goodness, we have work that we can do together. Now, the content of Living Landscapes, Meditation on the Five Elements in Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain Yogas arises from a 20-year translation project and reflection on my own training within Yoga Ananda Ashram and my own service as Pujari of the Ashram for six years. And it also reflects upon travel encouraged by none other than Frank Clooney of Harvard University, then of Boston College, to visit the elemental temples of South India. Now, I'll, I'll explain what um, characterized our training uh, in yoga. And I'm going to just pull out two highlights. One was weekly practice of yama and niyama. And the one chapter that people tend to reflect, remember from Yoga and the Luminous is the chapter where I reflect upon the practice. One week we would get a himsa paired with Swadhyaya. So to practice nonviolence and to perhaps reflect upon the greatness of Mahatma Gandhi and Shunya. Another week we would get Satya practice of truthfulness, and that might be paired with Santosha. And we journaled, we reflected, we had conversations, grounding ourselves from day one in Yoga Sadhana in the Yamas and Niyamas, week by week by week. Then after being settled in that practice, which continues, as well as being settled in weekly silence one day, now a half day, weekly fasting one day, we were given a practice of the Pancha Mahabhuta Dharanas. Not in theory, but no, sit down. with, okay, I'm gonna stop share for a minute and I'll go back to this, but sit down with a disc of earth. Sit with this for 20 minutes in the morning. Sit with this for 20 minutes at night. Think about it, reflect on it, see what happens. So the entire month, of October 1973, we literally grounded ourselves in this practice. So I invite you to gaze upon this plate of soil. It's been in my office for a while, so not much scent left to it, it's pretty dried out. But nonetheless, I know that you have, wherever you are, particularly in the eastern regions of the United States or in Europe or in the UK or in Ireland, that there will be a loam, there will be soil, there will be somewhere a potted plant, a field, maybe with sheep, particularly over there grazing. But I invite you to reflect 
as the Buddha advised his son to reflect, really our earliest record of this practice, to reflect upon how our existence relies upon the earth, and to reflect upon the great bounty that we receive from the earth. The crops, the quiet, the certainty, and with our ingenuity, think of all the stuff that we create from earth. I'm looking back here, okay, the steel that got forged formed the window frame from iron ore. The glass made of superheated sand. The wood from the forest. And then on the morning stacker, and I've got my pumpkin seeds and my pecans and my almonds and my walnuts. Okay, where does it all come from? Where does it end up? Okay, it ends up with this on Brahman, but it all originates in the earth. And what the Buddha told his son was to be like the earth. The earth gets stepped on every single day and never complains. Receive just as the earth receives. So as we look at this beautiful image created by Gabriella, we can feel our own body as the earth. In the first place that my companions, uh, my colleague, Chris Miller, who has spoken in the series, and a mutual friend, Kartik Dandapani, who grew up in Pondicherry. Some years back, I guess it was 2013, we did a whirlwind visit to the elemental temples. In Kanchipuram, a magnificent city in, in, in Tamil Nadu, from which we have learned so much about the worship of the goddess at another temple site in Kanchipuram. We have Ekambaranatham. And these temples are magnificent. They spread out over many, many acres. They're really almost like a college campus. And they're oriented toward the directions, the four directions, and they have honoring those four directions, the four goparams that sort of lift your awareness, lift your gaze high up into the sky. And each of these in honor of Lord Shiva and his consort Parvati include narrative that tells a story that brings us to recognition of the earth. And now what I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll sort of be elliptical in this, but one of the practices that this study led me to over that course of 20 years is a text called Yanarnava which then later gets absorbed in the Yoga Shastra, which represents a amalgamation of tantric practices that have gained currency and text, first sculpture and then text in the seventh, eighth century. And they include color visualization, they include mantra recitation, and they include geometry. What we will do, and it'll be very sparing, but you could sort of slow this tape down if, if you download it, is that with Earth, we get actually going back to 
the time of the Buddha, and then particularly the Vishuddhi Magga, and the passages are included in this book. As well as in the Yoga Vasishta, we get exhortations to focus your gaze upon the earth, to reflect on all the bounties of the earth, as we did, to surround yourself through your visual field with a tawny colored soil like evocation, to visualize the groundedness of a square or a cube. And then to support that gestalt, to support that mandala, if you will, you can see the square in the back of me. To visualize, perhaps, it could be in any script, but the syllable lum. And to say this again and again, lum, 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 lum. Lum, 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 lum. We've said it 18 times. And to appreciate the earth wherever you are. And I gaze out upon Bayona wetlands. Jim has been here and done the same. I think it was a beautiful sunset the night he was here. And that's wetlands. And in the distance, I see the Santa Monica Mountains. And I also see sycamore trees. When I was living in Dublin, when I visit London, I just love the London plane trees, which are a European-American hybrid, but include the DNA of the very sycamores that we have here in America. Then we move on to water. And true Vanekval is again a city in Tamil Nadu. And I had to get Kartik's help yesterday to make certain that I got the right temple because the Ranganathan temple is also in this town. And it's one of the most famous Vaishnava temples in the world and surround it with this cosmic city designed where the Brahmins live all facing the temple. And then there's neighborhoods for the Kshatriyas in back and then the Vaishyas in back. I mean, it's again, a wonderful place to visit. You have to have the right entree to each and every one of these places. I'm very grateful to Kartik for getting us entry. But this temple is the temple about water. And if you're able to lean in a little bit, you'll see there's an elephant. And you'll see, if you go on the website, that there's a spider. And the story associated with this temple is that this was originally open air and in veneration of a shingling, Shiva Linga. And every day, an elephant would come and do Abhisheka with his trunk upon the Shiva Linga. And every day, a spider would come and spin a web to protect the Shiva Linga. And it became a little bit conflictual a little bit too open air. So eventually the temple was built and they built it so that these creatures would not have dominion over this place where Shiva had lived. And they built an entry that you have to completely duck through to prevent the elephant from coming in. There's a whole story about this. But it's also cited in this particular town, right at a place where the humans had chosen to build one of maybe the earliest dam to check out the water that is a little bit sparing in Tamil Nadu historically. 
But as you enter the town, you see this lush abundance and you, um, some of the other photos that you could ramble around and look at show lots of palm trees, lots and lots of greenery. And this Jambukeshvara temple really gives a little bit of respite from the hot sun. Now, I'm lifting up, um, and I invite you to do the same. You've probably settled in for not a long winter's nap, but for a at least hour long Zoom, and you probably have your hydration with you. And sorry to boast, but I could look straight out and see not only the mist rising off the Pacific Ocean, but I actually do have a glimpse of the Pacific here. And my wife and I went down, Dick went down to our local beach, Playa del Rey, yesterday. And just seeing those gentle waves come again and again and again, like the breath. And what we were invited to do for that month of November, 1973, was to get a clear vessel of water and sit with it for 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the night, and waste our thoughts. As I found later in the Vishuddha Maga, same advice given to the Buddhist community, and to reflect upon all the ways in which our lives intersect with water. Without rain, there can be no food. Without saliva, there can be no digestion. Without the release of waters, we know we're in big trouble. And without the capacity to have the blessings of water internally and externally every day, our life becomes diminished. So as you can see here, what Dr. Bella did in reading these passages from the Yoga Vasishta, from the Vasudhimaga, from the Gyanarnava, she said, wow, the surf. Wow, the gifts of the ocean, the shells. Wow, the falling of the rain. And as the Yoga Vasishta reminds us, we've all had that experience. And I'm thinking of my time at Oxford being on, I think it's the River Thames there, or whatever that river is, and just celebrating its presence, as well as its capacity to move us, to let us be moved, to cleanse us, to hydrate us. So the Yoga Vasishta says, reflect on that river that you have known that pauses with its eddies and swirls like a friend before moving on as rivers always do. And the poetry, ah, celebrating water, so, so very magnificent. And then I invite you to visualize my heaven. Um, given to me by an art therapist. So I'm gonna stop share for a minute so that you can uh, visualize in your own way. Here we go. Um, not the shape this time of a square, but place upon that shape in your imaginative field, the shape of a crescent. A crescent, a bowl, on that cube that holds water. You can breathe from one side of this bowl up to the other side of the bowl as you inhale, and then exhale back out. And then visualize the color white as you would see with the ocean waves. Visualize it 
with water from stem to stern. And then we'll say the syllable lum, kind of uh, fricative labial doesn't exist in most languages. So we have to do wa. And we're going to do this syllable 18 times. White, crescent bowl, and lum. Lum, 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 lum. And then as you look at that exuberance of the water in movement, reflect upon what the Buddha told his son Rahula. He said, regard the water, be like water, Keep moving and like water, absorb anything that comes your way, even the putrid, and let it keep moving. Water sustains, water cleanses. So I think all of us know the story of Ramana Maharshi and what a blessing to go to this place in India. And as we gaze in the hill on the left, um, actually we have, and I wrote about it a little bit in the book, but John C., the great Australian echo activist, interviewed in Yoga Journal back in the days before the commercialization of yoga. And he wrote about his project on Mount Arunachala, this very mountain. And he had, on advice of folks at this, the Ramana Maharshi Ashram had said, we can do better. And did a reforestation, an afforestation project, so that as one now walks from the lower part of the ashram proper up to the cave where Ramana Maharshi lived and taught for many years, you're in for it with wildlife cheering you during your short pilgrimage to that wonderful place of meditation that hopefully some of you have visited. And from up that mountain, you can get a little bit bigger picture, literally, of what these elemental temples contain. Again, the four Gopurams the central worship site. And Ramana Maharshi as a young boy had asked that question again and again, who am I? Koham, Koham, Koham. And everything fell away. And we can do that a little bit as we sit here. And you know, I see all of these names, many of you have Gift it yourself with going off screen, but nonetheless, there's vestiges of you. And, you know, Ruth Westaby, hey, what a great name. I saw her image a little bit. I'm not invoking her to come on screen, but how Ruth is Ruth, how Westoby is Westoby, how Christopher is Christopher, how Chapel is Chapel. And we have these histories, we have these ancestors, we have these places we've lived, we've had, we've had these accomplishments, we've heaped on ourselves, and yet they all fall away. And he ended up in a heap, in that central worship space, subterranean, subsisting in his teens on leftover food that fell off the shrine dedicated to Ganesh. Powerful reflection burned up his attachments to identity. And for the month of December, we were 
instructed 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night to sit with a kindled flame. And with that kindled flame, remember, you're moving toward December. It's very dark. December on Long Island, very dark. The solstice, the darkest day of the year. And by invoking the light, we're connecting with that heat within our belly. We're invoking with, we're invoking warmth, so needed in so many climates in the dead of winter. And we're literally playing with fire with all of its blessings and all of its potential terror. And the syllable is rum. And if you uh, know the Devanagari, it's vaguely like a flame coming down. And if you remember Devanagari and Roman letters both come from the Phoenicians. And if you look at how we make an R, you can see some Cousin resemblances with the Devanagari are. But regardless, the shape geometrically is the upward triangle, like risen flames. And the color, orange, red, and the warmth that comes with the syllable rum. The warmth that comes from the funeral pyre. I remember being on the banks of the Ganges in Varanasi with the ashes of a man who lived and worked many years with Gandhi, invited by his daughter to swim these ashes into the river, which I did. And a pundit, I should say, a Purahit, had just constructed a fire and in the San Mandala that he created on the steps of the gods, he inscribed in that San Mandala this very letter, the letter Ram, which we will say 18 times. Ram, 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 and again, triangular flames, color, orange shred, and the purifying that comes through in a, a good yama in the yama week would be asteya, don't take what doesn't belong to you, and tapas, you know, do that fire practice that purifies your fasting, your silence. Now up in actually Andhra Pradesh, we see the Kalahasti temple, bustling place. And this was the time of day when we arrived. It was quite a drive up where we had started down in, um, in Chennai. And with air, we celebrate the stuff of life itself. And with air, and I invite you to just sort of inhale your arms up, perhaps even, and to exhale, to inhale up again, and to exhale, and to inhale up again, and exhale. And the Buddha tells his young son, be like the wind. It comes very lightly. It will carry any fragrance without complaint. And remember what Vasishta told to his young charge, the man who became Lord Rama. He said, watch the evidence of the wind. And as I gaze out this 
wall of glass and you can see the reflection a little bit but the sycamore tree that I invoked a little bit earlier, and I have a few of them in view, as well as a couple of eucalyptus that are visitors from Australia. As I watch these magnificent trees, what are they doing? They're dancing. And when Visishta imparted the Vayu Dharana, inviting Rama to feel the wind within his body, he said, what does the wind do? It teaches the vines and the fields of grass, teaches the creeping vines, teaches the trees themselves how to dance. And in the Vishuddhi Maga, where instruction is given for performing this dharana, it says, just look outside for this meditation and look at the ever-present wind and reflect on the ever-present breath. So Gabriella, invokes the bird and the bird within us and invokes the lungs and the heart. And as our instructions continued, and I'll um, talk about that um, momentarily, we came to see the connection between the element of air and touch. And the largest internal organ of the body is the lung, and the largest external organ of the body is the skin. The Shatipatthana counsels Meditation on the breath is the grounding point for the development of Vipassana and Samatha. And in the recitation of this mantra, we see an evocation of the downward triangle, the triangle that goes from your shoulders to your heart, and various texts associate different colors. Blue might work, or green. Different lists say different things. But in speaking that letter yum, in the Devanagari again, not so far off from the Y that we have, which is evoking that upward triangle, we get a sense of bringing the air into that center point of the heart. So we're gonna do this also 18 times. And I invite you to join in, or if you tune in later to um, follow along. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. And this stabilizing way of connecting with the breath becomes a gateway into the ethereal. And the Chidambaram temple, the Nataraja temple, you can see. <laughs> and it's a 365 day per year job to keep these temples painted. And I remember my first journey to India in 1981, places such as these were in pretty bad shape. But since the rise of when global capitalism hit India, 
only 10 years later, 1991, the middle class just sort of rose up and uh, put lots of resource, their own money, into making certain that these shrines are maintained. And one of our hosts, it was actually um, at the Arunachala Temple, uh, said, yeah, when I was a little boy, we used to come in here and play cricket all the time. Now there's all these pilgrims. And for him, it was just neighborhood space to play. And with the rise in religiosity throughout um, at least India and uh, the money to back it up, there's now this um, move to upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. And look at that color, remarkable. And as we entered this particular temple space, rather than having at the central worship spot, the linga, it was merely space. Off to the side, images of Shittanacharaj, the Lord of the dance, but an evocation of how our dance, and again, I'm going to tie this into Sankhya rather explicitly, but how the space of our dance creates the worlds we occupy, how Prakriti moves through space and with space to create the world, to create the worlds where we take up residence simultaneously and in sequence through our memory back through so many worlds and by our imaginative engagement with these spaces, the worlds that come through the stories particular to these particular spaces of when Shiva walked here, when Parvati showed up, when they were in courtship, when they were in union, Beautiful, beautiful invitation. And what I sit here facing north, and as someone who eventually took vows to yoga, our training, which went year after year after year after year, pretty much took me a couple of years to say, okay, I'm on board, but the whole thing required 12 years. We would just gaze into the sky. And if you have a window, I invite you, unveil it. We would just simply gaze into that sky 20 minutes at morning, 20 minutes at night, preferably sunrise and sunset, but this was the month of January, so the days were a bit short. And if you look at the image, images on the screen, you'll see the Indian sky but with monsoon clouds. We don't get that very often here in California. And Gabriella, I love the androgyny of this image. I love the particulate framing within this image. And in terms of the space in the body, it's within the throat. In terms of the syllable invoked, which is not represented here, it is hum. And if you look at the hum in Devanagari, you'll see, oh, it sort of does look like the apparatus of the human throat that creates word. And if you look at H in the Roman alphabet, it looks like the chair we sit on. And this part of the body that we invoke is the goddess Vak herself. And we'll do this 18 times. Visualizing a crystal sphere sitting upon the downward triangle, which intersects with the upward triangle, which 
extends its foundation upon the crescent ball, which sits upon a cube. Earth, cube, crescent ball, water, upward triangle, fire, downward triangle, fire. And here we get this, which I think really extends and includes the entire apparatus of the skull as well as the glottis. But we're going to do another mantra for that above part. So space. We find space in our throat. Hum 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 And then finally to round this out, sort of visualize as if you have someone painting it on you, something of an ohm. And I remember my dean who went on to become president of Santa Clara University gazing at our world religions exhibit and saying, what is that? And I said, what's that three? And I said, oh, and I realized even though he had done his research on the history of religion, including Buddhism in Los Angeles from the 19th century, that this managed to escape him. But that universal sound, that universal image of Om will bring us up to 108 recitations, invocations of the mantric foundations for our respective acts of creation. So we'll do 18 Ohms. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how all of this connects with Sankhya and then open it up for questions. So again, and uh, Gabriella masterminded also this block print yantra, where if you see, we have the square, we have the circle, there's triangles in there. And um, yeah, there's just a bindu in the very center, just a seed of awareness in red in the middle. But that seed can be the seed syllable, Om. So 18. Om, 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 So back when I was, let's see, I would have been um, 19 when we went through these meditations. And it was our foundational training. And it continued. And in the month of February, we were to reflect upon fragrance. In the month of March, we were to reflect upon flavor. In the month of April, we were to reflect upon four. In the month of May, we were to reflect upon feeling the touch upon the skin. In the month of June, we were to reflect upon sound. Then one of my colleagues, okay, because we were, again, teenagers, and at university, and we had the gift of studying Sanskrit. We had the gift of an amazing professor of Indian philosophy, Antonio de Nicholas, who had lived for about 15 years in India and trained with the Gandhians at Sevagram after deciding not to become a Jesuit. And he had studied with Gaspar Coleman, who did that wonderful book, Patanjali Yoga. And then we had the gift also of the Radhakrishnan anthology as our, as our textbook. And we that next year dove into a full year study of Sankhikarika. And this has become a lifeline to what is reality, but also a lifetime of study and reflection. 
And what we came to learn from the text is that as we made those connections with the Panchamahabhutas, that we were going also to that place of the Tanmatras in that meditative state, going to the place of that subtle relationship that gives birth to a tactile world. We were also giving honor to the senses in sequence. And Guru Ma would say, um, what is the nose ring about? It's to honor the great God of your nose, Nasa. What is the earring about? It's to honor the great God of your capacity to hear. Just amazing reflections. And through learning the water method, some of you know what I'm talking about, we sort of revisited our very physical anatomy and learned of that relationship between Muladhara and earth, Svadhisthana and water, Manipura and fire. The hands are creative force in the world and our feet, our capacity to move about, our voice, our capacity speak and all the while what are we doing with those yamas and niyamas we're cleaning up our booties okay we're cleaning up our bhavas we're tending to our relationships through thought voice and action and we came to learn about the power of the mind the power of the ego for better and for ill and the pervasiveness of the bhavas of buddhi in determining and setting out the world that we occupy. And yes, of course, we reveled in the culmination of the Sankhikarika, where it says, she gets embarrassed. Okay, what gets embarrassed? Our prakritis. Okay, one of the great examples that I had for this was um, I asked my students, having landed here in Los Angeles, I said, have you ever done something where someone embarrassed you and you knew you were never going to do it again? And sort of transforming that central metaphor into like, what does this do in your life? How does it work? And I had a student, Filipino-American student, I could see him, even though it's 37 years ago. And he said, yeah, we have this grocery store, and we all knew it, lucky. And they had tried to be a little bit low cost and tried to be a little bit co-op like, and they had these bins where you're supposed to take a scoop and you know, weigh out your own nuts or candy. He said, I love bolt balls. And he said, one day I was over there in Lucky and I was just stealing malt balls. But not only was he stealing malt balls, he was violating the shaucha. He was doing a shaucha. He was violating purity. And his saliva was going back into those malt balls. And he's like, you know, a 17, 18 year old kid. And he says, then I felt someone staring at me. And I turned around and this woman had this look on her face. I will never put my hand in malt balls again. So he had a bija dagda experience. His seed of karma, of the desire for those malt balls, was forever obliterated. And I believe him. And that moment of arrest, that moment of Chittavriti Naroda, that moment when we realize we've been stupid and we sort of get over ourselves gives a little bit of a glimmer in that humiliation of what it means to be free. So I spent probably about 15 years developing an asana routine that's the appendix to this book that goes A to Z, linking the elements with the postures, with the bhavas, with the tattvas and a little bit with mantra. And I'll close with 
a little tip of the hat to the very last of the Yoga Sutras. The last Yoga Sutra, Chitti Shakti. Okay, what do we do with this? Okay. And what I would offer is that for Vyasa, he said, oh, Jivan Mukti. Okay, that, yeah, we can be free while we are alive. And this lifting up of the elements, this lifting up of the senses, this lifting up of the human body itself, this lifting up of the complexity of emotion and mind. Okay, all of this is thoroughly suffused, whether we're in the Buddhist world or the many, many different Hindu worlds or in the Jain world even. And I'm just gonna close by um, speaking forth a mantra that our guru shared, and many of you know it. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Shakti Rupena Samskita Namaste 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 Namo Namaha And as I relate in the book, my last phone call with Thomas Berry, who introduced the world to even the concept of religion and ecology. And he said, so tell me, Chris, what's your project? I was at Swarthmore Quaker Retreat outside of Philadelphia. And I said, you know, people think Indians hate the world. People think that Sankhya is all about running away and escaping. But what I want to do is to give folks a toolbox so that they can enter into a celebration of consciousness, a celebration of the universe, a celebration of the stuff of the planet itself, so that we can keep going through thick and thin and do what it is that we need to do. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Chris, for that wonderful uh, meditation on the on the five elements. Um, so we've got about we've got about ten minutes for questions, and I've got a couple, and I think we've got a couple coming on the Slido. So I'm going to start. I've got a, yeah, a couple of questions I have. Um, last the last uh, talk that we had was from Lorelai Berniaki, and she was looking at Chamatkara, a wonder, particularly with reference yeah. to Avinavata. And how it fitted into, or how it fits into his soteriology, and it seemed to me uh, today in your talk, as you discuss the various um, Buddhas, the various elements, that the 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 reaction that you were you seem to evoke, and that perhaps you were trying to uh, evoke in 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 the audience too, is one of wonder, Chamatkara. and I'm just wondering how if at all does that fit into a broader yogic soteriology i mean do you see do you see this and and also on a more sort of specific level when guru ma was asking you to do these meditations or dharanas or whatever you might call them on the different elements was there a broader purpose or was it just to evoke these uh this apparent feeling of, of, of wonder i think is what you were what, what i took from it anyway so how does that fit into a yogic soteriology, if at all? Yes, I mean, that's very much part of the whole experience. And Vimarsha, another word for wonder. And what happened with Abhinavagupta is that he just became sort of the drone in back of how religiosity found expression in India moving forward. And what Guru Ma's teachings did was to sort of unpack that and give granular instruction about how to cultivate a state of wonder. And once you learn that, then you can't not be affected. And I love how the Tibetans put it. They say, and this was very much my experience back in those days, 
and continues to be my experience, is that you have a platform of your meditation, and that's nice. But what's important are the epiphanies that arise throughout the day as a consequence of that meditation. So like with my undergraduates, and we've been doing this systematically through the semester as I've taught this book, and we do it collectively, and I say, now I want you to do this every day, but I know that you won't. But what I want you to do is as you're walking across campus and you see those trees, you're doing your homework. And I test them once in a while. I say, what type of tree is that? And you know, sometimes they remember, sometimes they don't. But the idea is to cultivate this ongoing sense of wonder that will allow that movement towards sattva to prevail and serve as an antidote to the default of being tamasic. So great question. Thank you. And we've got a few questions, well, quite a lot pouring in. I'm going to use my chair's privilege to ask one more, if that's OK. Um, because I think in the title, I haven't got it in front of me of your talk, was looking at the, the Pancha Mahabhuta tradition in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. Uh, I think that's what it was. So I've been wrestling with this, the, 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 the thorny problem of four versus five elements. So we find it, I think, in traditional early buddhism there are four elements but then in tantric buddhism Vajrayana, there are five is that right and can you can you can you shed a bit more light on what's going on there how can how can we have different numbers of elements well it's actually sort of interesting because if we look at the resource in the buddhist tradition um from the um um the literature in the Vasudhi Maga, um, yeah, it's there. And in the Maha Rahulo Vada Sutta, it's there. And in the Datu Vibhanga, it's there. So um, on the one hand, it's very difficult to teach. And in the Yoga Vasishta, it actually sort of leaves it out. It just sort of says, then I looked at the sky, and he doesn't say anything much more other than return to the narrative. But yeah, just like with the chakras, there's different lists, just like with the Angas of Yoga, there's different lists. Uh, and from the earliest data that we have from the literature, it does appear that there were, were five. Because, I mean, I'll quote the Dhatavabhanga here, it says, as he's talking to um, Pukasati, which is a whole other great story. Uh, what is the space property? The space property may be either internal or external. What is internal? Anything internal, belonging to oneself is space, spatial and sustained. The holes of the ears, the nostrils, the mouth, the passage, whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, where it collects. Um, this is internal, and then the external, and then this is the great thing, um, is um, the statement which is the enlightened statement is this is not mine this is not me this is not myself and what happened P pukasati got this and they had been training late at night in a shed in the back of some farmer's house and pukasati didn't know that this was the buddha and he said oh now i got to become a monk so as he was preparing the next day to become initiated he got gored by a bull and killed and you can't make these things up. I mean, this this undoubtedly happened if we use biblical criteria, because it's just so weird. And the other monks were saying, oh, you must have had horrible karma. And what the Buddha said was, hey, don't pass judgment on that guy. I just spent through the wake of the night with him. We went through all of the elements. We got all the way up to space itself. He got it. Naham nasmi name. He was free. So, yeah, but that's the way it's evoked, and it's obviously not an element like the others, but it's a, a space nonetheless. Okay, but it's, but it's, there's, so there's a, a, a canonical group of four, and that's an extra one. No, it's not extra. He said five elements, punch them up. Okay, so there's some yeah. kind of debate within the tradition over the, over the. Yeah, yeah, early. Okay, great. Thank you. Now we've got bunch of questions if we could we've only got five minutes so if we can go to Vikram is that possible he's at the top of the hit parade of the uh, questions we have his upvoting system Chris so 
warms up. James, uh, could you ask a question? I'm in a bit of a noisy environment. Sure. It was a really good talk. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So Vikram has asked a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the first is interesting one for you. What yogic and meditation beliefs you did you hold before but no longer subscribe to and why? Oh, okay. Um, I started when I was 13 with Zen and then 15 with Quakers and then with my guru when I was 18. So when I first started with um, Zen, I discovered very quickly that there's a rhythm that sets in, but it doesn't always set in. So I learned patience, that you can't make it happen. And then what I learned a little bit later was that if I, I thought my thoughts were straying from, say, my dharana on the earth, that I could just back up and find that my launch point was my original intention. So I think the thing that I learned was to just um, not put pressure, but just to do it consistently and then accept what comes. Great, thank you. And then Vikram had another question, which has also been voted up. Would you recommend doing the Pancha Mahabhuta temple pilgrimage by oneself or with a guide? And is there a particular order to follow? <laughs> um, you can't do it by yourself. First of all, there's just too much complicated travel. I mean, if you're from Tamil Nadu, sure. But if you're not from Tamil Nadu, you have to find a friend companion. We did it. Um, to our geographic convenience. So we went up to Andhra first and did the air temple first, and then they were all sort of out of order, but definitely. And um, it, if you can't find anybody, I can connect you probably with Kartik who is splits his time. He's an engineer and can work from wherever in the world. And he loved doing this. Um, and you get entry. When I told Frank Kuluni that I did this, he said, you did what? And um, yeah, we went into the inner sanctum of each of these. And he says that personally, he would not because he knows he's not supposed to. And personally, I would because I've been thoroughly initiated into the symbolism of all of this. Great, thanks. Um, I, so presumably, you, are you normally meant to finish at Chidambaram because that's Akasha? That's so how I set it up, but yeah. that wasn't the order. I think we were in uh, Kanchipuram last. Okay, thanks. So next, there's an anonymous question. Uh, and it's actually paired with a similar one by someone called Aika Turner, who could ask the question. Well, I'll read out the anonymous one. Where are the earliest textual references to five element meditation located? And did they originate in a particular tradition or milieu? Yeah, I think we have to just go straight to the Rig Veda and um, more hymns to Agni than any other entity in the Rig Veda. And uh, one of the interesting newish movements in India is the um, Gayatri Parivar, where they have placed the creation and reverence of fire at the heart of their practice. And as we sort of reflect, and I don't know about in, yeah, I'm sure that you do this. You go camping and you sit around a campfire and you just sort of get that primal connection with this element. Uh, so I think that, you know, obviously the fire ritual became very specified in terms of um, size, quantity, when, where, et cetera, et cetera. But that is itself a, a meditative process, just setting up. Um, and it's at the core of every puja. I mean, every puja, even Jain pujas, have the kindling of the flame. And this is um, really foundational. Okay, thanks. But what about, I mean, if more so the specific meditations that you were referring to with Bija mantras and, and so forth? Presumably they have. Yeah, in, in terms of um, probably the Pukasati. 
uh, which is a, a Buddhist um, scripture that tells the story of Pukaseti. And uh, it tells what to do. And then it's interesting what the text that I found from the yoga tradition that does this um, sequentially is Miranda Samhita, and those passages are translated in here with the benefits that accrue. And unlike our sort of meditation light of 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night, you have to do it for two and a half hours. And it's pretty intense. And then James, I'm sure, has witnessed the Pancha Agni ceremonies. We have the fire in front, the fire in back, the fire on one side, the fire on the other side, and then the fire on your head. These are very ancient practices. Great. Well, thank you very much. We've we've run it. We've gone over time. Sorry, we've kept you a bit too long, but that was great. Wonderful, uh, wonderful way to for us to spend our evenings. We're very relaxed after that, having been through the the cosmos, and the five elements. And so, thank you so much for. Um, so, say a bit more. So, the book is out, is it, or it's? it's yeah, it's out, book? and um, the wow. ebook is available, and the paperback is available. Fantastic. Yeah, and the illustrations that I shared. I didn't put the temples in. It's too complicated. But this is the appendix that includes my humble asana routine that I do. Let's go with the different elements. Uh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you so so much, Chris. And I hope we get to see you in person again before too long.